Here is my electronics workbench and in the middle of the bench is a four channel amplifier. A couple of years ago there was a power surge in the house and it blew out the chips on these two amplifiers. Now it is time to make some repairs. Each of the amplifiers consists of two two channel amplifier modules, the power control board that senses audio input and a small 5 volt power supply that powers the cooling fans. And now let's get into my repair process. Now I have the two amplifiers on the bench and I have already pulled off one of the modules. Zooming in closer we can see a black scorch mark on the leads to the chip that resulted from the power surge. This system is powered by 120 volts AC and surges measured during the event were between 200 and 300 volts. Taking a tour around the cabinet we have the other two channel amplifier module, a toroidal power transformer, 5 volt power module for the fans and the power control board. Getting ready to start the repair I have already removed the heat sink from the chip. I've got my desoldering tools ready, a PC board clamp, a soldering iron as well as a hot air station though I do not believe I will be using the hot air station during this repair. Now it is time to get that burnt chip up off the board. You can actually see here where a couple of leads burnt off when the chip shorted. Using flush cut wire cutters I go across and cutting off all the leads close to the chip. I have seen many people use this type of cutter for other than PC board work and then they complain that it does not function well. The design intent of flush cut wire cutters is to trim the leads on a circuit board and nothing else. Don't complain about tools when used outside of their design intent. And now that I've got the chip off we can get a better look at where the leads burnt off. Here is where I straighten all the leads to make it easier to get them off the board. Now with the board in the PC board holder I will be grabbing the lead sticking out of the board and pulling while heating up the other side. This was way more difficult than it should have been because I was working around the camera tripod. To try to make things easier I'm going to use solder wick to suck most of the solder up off the pads. I've seen many reviews complaining that solder wick does not work and most of the time it is because they were using underpowered solder irons. It takes a lot of heating powers to get the solder wick up to temperature where it will suck up the solder. Sometimes the addition of some flux will help the solder wick work. And now you can see the solder wick getting flooded with solder. Flipping the board over to work on the inner row I found that one of the leads was bent over and manually soldered to a trace on the board. Apparently the manufacturer of this PC board forgot to connect that pad to the trace and this was a hack to resolve that error. You will see later that I resolved this error was a different method.
you can see here that I am having trouble getting enough heat on the pad, and in this case, adding solder to the pad will resolve the problem. Note that using too much pulling force on the lead plus not enough heat has the potential of pulling the pad right off the board. Now that all the leads have been removed, it is time to prepare it for the new chip. First I've got to get all that old solder off the board using a solder sucker as well as more solder wick, but first I add some flux to the pads. Once the solder wick has done everything it can do, I get a solder sucker to clear the holes. This would be much easier with a true solder station equipped with a solder vacuum, but those are too expensive for me. And now the last thing I will need to do is clean off the residual flux with alcohol. Now that the board is all cleaned up, it is time to prep it for the new chip, which is cleaning up the holes. I have a micro drill bit in a pin vise and run it through any problem holes. When doing this, you must be certain that the bit used is significantly smaller than the hole or you run the risk of damaging the copper plated through holes. Now I need to analyze why that pin was bent over and soldered to a trace. First identifying that the pad is actually not connected to anything. Now knowing which pin it is, I pulled out one of my PC boards and verified that this pin, along with pin 20, was supposed to be grounded. And now that the chip is fully removed, I will confirm that there are any other failures on this board due to the power surge before installing a new chip. But before we continue, an example of the design intent for flush cuts. Looking at the bottom of the board, the leads on the capacitor are extending significantly beyond the solder joint. Placing the flush cuts on the leads cuts it flush with the solder, hence the name, flush cuts. Testing on the board found no further faults, so now it's time to get a new chip on the board. Here are the chips I have on hand which are now obsolete. I was lucky to have some spares. And now the fun of getting all 26 pins aligned with the 26 holes. Patience are key when doing this. Now that I have it inserted, I will position it so that it is straight and level on the board, then solder two opposite pins on the component side to fix it in place. I install the fine tip on my iron and will be using a very small diameter solder, 0.38 millimeters. This helps to avoid solder bridges across pads. One pin is soldered and then flip the board around for a better view. This would be much easier if the camera was not in the way. I solder the pin on the other end ensuring the chip is straight and then go across the inner row.
Now I flip it over and solder all the bottom pads. Last thing I need to do is fabricate a jumper to correct the PC board trace error. Every time I solder through whole components on a PC board I always save the leads trimmed off and that's what I will be using to fabricate this jumper. I will take this short lead, form one end, and then the other end trim to length. I use my PC board to form the jumper at the correct length to jump the pads. I used a marker to identify the pad to avoid connecting the wrong pads together and now it is a matter of soldering the jumper. Adding some fresh solder to the two pins as well as the ends of the jumper and the repair is done. After a bit of cleanup we're ready to test the module which is already set up on the bench. I have an old MP3 player as my audio source and an old bookshelf speaker for the output. Up here is my power source. Turn on the power. Turn up the volume and I have a successful repair. I had to cut the audio or the tube might censor my video for copyright restrictions. Now I need to repeat this process three more times for the other modules. The second PC board had extensive damage. <clears throat> See if we can get a close up of the damage here. Get the glare of the light out of the way. Here you can see we lost this whole trace was burned off. There's a little bit right there still attached. This pin here is supposed to be attached to that pin there and this pin's over here for this long bus. And over here, there is the jumper that I formed to replace that trace. You know, I can't do the replacement on camera because this is close-up work. And we'll show you what it looks like after I get it in there. Here is my PC board repairs. We've got my jumper in place connecting the three points here. There was also this one on this side that was uh, fried. We'll be adding a fuse in this circuit to prevent that from ever happening again. But this board is repaired and now I'm going to have to test it and then I've got two more boards to fix. Now that all the modules are repaired it is time to reassemble the amplifier but first a quick look around. The amplifier module on the left is one I purchased. I had three of these and then it was discontinued, although I needed four. The module on the right is one I cloned and is essentially a duplicate of the ones I purchased. After building these amplifiers using these modules, I designed one of my own and here's an image of the prototype. I had 100 of these PC boards made and intended to sell them on eBay, but nobody was interested. I also built one complete two-channel amplifier and developed a kit, but again, no one was interested. It was an optimized design incorporating surface mount devices and a built-in cooling fan power supply. Now back to the assembly. Top left is the toroidal power transformer. I have two terminal buses that sit underneath the boards. The bus on the left is the AC high voltage power input going to the transformer and up here is the output of the transformer into the audio switchboard. The switchboard monitors the audio input and turns on the main power when there is an incoming signal. The terminal bus on the right is the low voltage from the transformer going to the modules. And here is another look at the cooling fan 5 volt power supply. This is a DC-DC switching power supply and here is a look at the circuit diagram. I found out later that the power surge that killed the amplifier modules also killed one of these power supplies. 
The repair of that one is coming up later. Now an overhead look as I reassemble one of the amplifiers. There are nylon spacers that have to be positioned to hold up the PC board as well as two screws holding down the heatsink. It can be challenging getting those nylon spacers lined up with the holes. Here's my DC converter. We take a quick look up here. And you see we've got an input 29 volts. Let's get back back down to the PC board. Uh, you can't see my voltmeter I'm using for testing. First thing we're going through here is a full wave bridge rectifier. And on the other side of that, we've got 28 volts, so we know this is good. Uh, according to the power supply, there's no current flow through the system. Looking right here, there's a deformity on this chip. Could be a blown component inside the chip. Uh, let's remove power. Let's go to my diode test. Over here, we've got a Schottky diode. and a short circuit across the diode. Now that could mean the diode's bad, or it could mean the chip is blown because the diode's connected to the chip. Uh, so the next step is I'm gonna pull this diode up off the board and do the same test. Here we've got the diode. Now we're going to check to see if we're still short circuit on that board. We no longer have a short circuit on the board. So, listening to the meter, we're going to test the diode here off camera. And that's interesting because the diode tests okay. Duplicating the test here. And it is actually the same resistance both ways. But the diode's good, and that tells me that uh, the chip has failed. So now we're going to have to get this chip off of here. And now I've got to set up to remove the chip. Now it is time to repair that DC converter. First thing I need to do was get that solder off those terminals, and for that I'm going to use the solder sucker to get most of it. Then I switch to the solder wick to get the balance. Once the greater majority of the solder is off the pads, I switch to the hot air gun for the final removal. Easier than it was 
Now I have the board prepped and it's time to get the parts installed. First up is that diode. The proper way for surface mount devices is to use solder paste and the hot air gun, but I don't have any solder paste at this time. So in this case I will put a small dab of solder on one of the pads. Add just a bit of flux, then carefully place the diode in location. The angle of the camera makes it appear that the PC board is at an angle, but I assure you that it is level. Now I heat up the pad with just a bit of pressure holding down the diode. With the first pad attached, I fully solder the other pad and then go back to the first pad to ensure it is properly soldered. And now to get the new DC converter chip installed. First, using my flux pan, I will add just a little bit of flux to all the pads for the chip. Now getting the leads formed so that they will line up with the holes in the PC board. Once on the board, I solder each pin, ensuring that the solder flows up onto the pin. Everything is ready and now the test. I set the power input to 28 volts and can see I have 5 volts on both fan connectors. Woohoo! Another successful repair. Now quickly going through the process of reinstalling the cooling fan power supply confirming that is working and all is good. Now both amplifiers are repaired and it is time to reassemble the entire system. Now my sound system is back together here in my media center. Two large towers for left and right channels and a center speaker. There is a subwoofer built into the television stand and below the center speaker you can see one of the two amplifiers. Now panning over to the other side of the room and we see the right side speaker. And then up in the corner is the corner shelf cabinet I built for the other amplifier as well as a stand for the right rear speaker. One of these days I plan to build another one of those corner shelf cabinets so I have a pair and a proper place for that left rear speaker to set. The last part of this video is highlighting the amplifier inside the cabinet. The look of these amplifiers is not aesthetically pleasing. The one in the media center is fairly well hidden, but one on the back is pretty ugly sitting there on the shelf. Now doesn't this look much better? And this is the conclusion of my project repairing my 7.1 channel audio system. Remember to subscribe to be notified when I publish my next project.